do as much as Islam that you can do, whether using the social media, on WhatsApp, on Facebook, utilize these time, do Islam with your friends. You can even do Dawah to your, to your friends. This is the 33rd uh, uh, recommended act in the month of Ramadan. Do Dawah to your non-Muslim friends, invite them towards Islam. There are more chances that the heart will open towards Islam in the month of Ramadan, since the gate of heaven is open, the gates of hell are closed, uh, and the shaitan, the devils, they are chained. Besides reading the first Salah and the Sunnah of the Mokrida, even read the Sunnah of the Gaur Mokrida, especially in the month of Ramadan. And there are 10 Sunnah of the Gaur Mokrida, that is two Rakat, Sunnah, Gaur Mokrida, after the Zuhar Salah, 2 plus 2, 4 Rakat before the Asar of Salah, 2 Rakat before the Maghrib Far Salah, and 2 Rakat before the Isha Far Salah. So basically the 10 Rakat of Surat uh, Al-Qur'an Mokadda. So totally there are 17 plus 3, 20, plus 12 Surat Al-Mokadda, that's 32, and then 10 of the Gera Mokadda, that is 42. If you add the Vitar, it becomes, if you add the Taravi, it becomes an additional 8, that becomes 50. If you add the Salat Dua, it becomes additional 4, that becomes 54. So see to it that you at least read 54 minimum Raqqa in a day, and you can keep on adding the Sunnah after doing Wudu and various others. But these, try and do it. This, it will be, it will be beneficial for you. This is the... Uh, 34th recommended act. The 35th recommended act in the month of Ramadan is that do more and more increase in your dua and your supplication. After the salah, do more dua in the month of Ramadan, inshallah Allah will accept it. The next is that you attend Islamic lectures. Physically, if you cannot, there are live sessions. And now because of social media, there are so many conferences and lectures we can attend live like the, what you're doing today. You're watching me live. I'm in Malaysia and people from all over the world, maybe more than 200 countries in the world, they're seeing on the Peace TV network, they're seeing on the social media, the Facebook, and millions are watching. Take the opportunity, live programs. Next, you can even see recorded programs. You can see lectures, Islamic lectures on the YouTube, on the other social media, the video recordings, and try and get as much knowledge as possible. In this month of Ramadan, you have to be, give more time to your family. In the month of Ramadan, you have to give more time, and now because you are logged on at home, see to it that you spend more time with your family, get the ajar, come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a blood prophet said, the best amongst you is he who is the best to the family, to the wife, to the children, etc. So see to it that you make the most of it. Read as much as of the seerah of the prophet. And the best book I can recommend is of uh, Mubarak Safi Rahman Puri, Mubarak Puri, Safi Rahman Mubarak Puri, The Seal Nectar, Rekal Maktum. See to it in this month of Ramadan, you, you meet others and you help them as much as you can. In this month of Ramadan, the 41st point, be more cheerful and happy. And the last 42nd point I would like to mention besides various other points is that see to it that you spread love and affection and care to the other people around you. This was just in brief about the 42 recommended things that you can do in the month of Ramadan and take the opportunity of this isolation, being at home, and you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sorry today also I spoke for about half an hour, thought I'd speak for 20 minutes, but I did speak less than last time so that we can have more time for, for the question of succession. I would like to remind you that you can mention your questions, preferably on the WhatsApp as a text message to with writing your name as well as the city and the country of your residence you can take this message to the whatsapp number plus 
I repeat, plus 60 We will try and pick up what the, the team is trying to select questions. We have some questions which were pending, we'll be taking. Also, the new questions that are coming, even on the Facebook, as well as, and just to tell you that in the last time I came live, on the Facebook alone, 911,000 people watched it. More than 911,000 people, mashallah, it reached, alhamdulillah. Sorry, watched. It reached about two point, more than 2.8 million people. It reached only on the Facebook, out of which more than 911,000 people watched it, and 206,000 people more than that gave comments, and there were more than 20,000 questions. Inshallah, you can find your question. You can, you can even write on your Facebook, on, on the YouTube, on the Instagram, but the chances are more, they'll be selected from the WhatsApp. And where's the mobile? There are various messages. I can't see. There are a lot of things. Many people are saying salam. I would like to say walaikum salam to all of you. There are, there are people love you and, and I love you too. There is Mateen Rana. He's saying I'm from Mirat. And assalamu alaikum to too. There is An Anichur Rahman. Thanks. And thanks to you too. From Afghanistan, you have Sahal Khan. He's saying may Allah bless you. May Allah bless you too. We have some people saying we love you, welcome, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love you too. May Allah bless you and your family from Muhammad Musarraf, and so on. We will just go on to the questions. Some have been selected and my team is sending me questions. After. The first question is from a non-Muslim. He's saying peace be upon you. My name is Abraham from New Delhi. The question is, when people revert back to Islam, like Cassius Clay, Sonny Bill Williams, and Mike Tyson, and many more. So Muslims say that God gave them guidance, Hidayah. So that's why they reverted. I wanted to know why he, God, didn't give guidance to everyone. Why he gave guidance to some people and not to all. And this is a very important question by our brother Ibrahim. Uh, Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 99, that if he wanted, he could have made all the human beings in this world as believers. So for Allah to make 100% of the human beings, now there are more than 7.75 .7 billion human beings, for Allah to make all the human beings as believers, as Muslim, is very easy, kun fayakun. But the question is that we human beings are one of the best creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah hayata. It is he who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. So this life is a test for the hereafter. So when you are coming, in, coming for a test, for an examination, the supervisor cannot help you. And even if you do something wrong, can pass you. I mean, supervisor can, can, can see to it that you, don't, that you don't break the rules. The teacher can give you grace marks, but cannot pass you if you have failed and did not write anything or broke all the rules. So in the same fashion, regarding the question, if Allah wanted, he could have made all the human beings the Muslim, but then what is the difference? All the other human, all the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except the jinn and the human beings, they obey him. So what difference is in this creation of human being. Regarding why does he select few people? There are some criteria for Allah to select who he guides. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that if you strive in the pathway of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will open up your pathways. That means anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, if he strives, if he struggles, in the path of Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up the pathways. All these people, whether it be Cassius Clay, whether it be Mike Tyson, whether it, whether it be Cash Steven, if you read the history, when, when they were non-Muslim, they strived. They, 
like you, if you hear the story, the background of Cash Stevens was a pop singer, now he's called Yusuf Islam. When his life was in danger, he said that if, if you save my life, oh my God, I will dedicate my life towards you. And then someone gave him a copy of the Quran, he read the Quran and he came close to Islam. So if you strive, irrespective whether you're a Christian or a Hindu or a non-Muslim, if you sincerely strive to come too close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will come close to Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the only criteria required for you is striving and struggling that I want to find the true Almighty God and follow His commandments. Inshallah, Allah will get you closer, whether you will read the Quran and come close to Allah, whether you will hear the lecture of Adai and come close to Allah, you may attend the event, you may hear the Adhan. The main criteria is you strive to come closer to Almighty God and inshallah Allah will give you Hidayah. Hope that answers the question. Uh, uh, there's a question by, by Muhammad Rehan. It's a question that just came on the WhatsApp. From West Bengal, India. I gave dawa to my non-Muslim friend and she accepted Islam on the first of Ramadan. But, but she's married and has a little child. Now she can't tell her family that she is uh, can't tell her family that she has accepted Islam. So my question is, is it okay if she worships idols till she can't tell her family about Islam? One more question, is it okay if a man gives dawah to a woman? Thank you. As far as the question, is it okay that she can worship idols till the time she informs the family? Idol worship is the biggest sin in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, if Allah pleases, he may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk he will never forgive. So idol worship is the biggest sin. After doing shirk, if you ask for forgiveness, inshallah Allah will forgive that also. Now that she, has, that she has accepted Islam, she should not do idol worship. And it's not a must. In the Hindu family, they don't do idol worship every day. If a family even is very pious and doing the rituals, surely you can make an excuse and avoid doing it. If you feel telling your family is a little bit risky now, you can delay in telling maybe after a few days, after a few weeks, no problem. But see to it that you stay away from the sins, especially the major sin of idol worship. Can a man give dawah to a woman? Yes, as long as he doesn't break the rules of the hijab. Like I am coming now on the Peace TV, on the Facebook, on the social media, and there are hundreds and thousands of ladies also watching, no problem. But if many people say that they want to do one-to-one -one dawah with a, non, with a man doing to a woman, to a non madam that is not recommended, and especially in a closed room. As the Prophet said, if a man and a woman, the opposite sex, are in a closed room and there's no third person, the third person is the devil. So you have to maintain the hijab. You cannot do one-to-one -one dawah. You cannot laugh and joke with a non madam You can talk, but with lowering your gaze, saying that there's not too much complacent, there's not too much complacent in your voice. So maintaining the hijab, you can do best is through books or through social media. Hope that answers the question. There are many people, Kifayat, Kifayatullah saying, please, thanks to you. There is Khidr Azijjad, why don't you come to Pakistan? Inshallah, whenever Allah wills, I will come. There is an Uh, the next question is that I am Abdullah from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. My question is that if a Muslim dies in a plague, will he be called a martyr or will he just get the sawab of a martyr? There are various hadiths talking about this incident of a person dying in the plague. Abdullah said, it's mentioned hadith of Tirmidhi, volume number two, hadith number 1063. The, that the Prophet said, there are five types of martyrs in Islam. The one who is killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person who dies in the plague, a person who dies of stomach illness, a person who dies while drowning, and a person who dies in a crush or a collapse, maybe a house has collapsed. So these five categories of the people, according to the Prophet, they are martyrs. So if a person dies in plague, yes, he's called as a martyr. Then another hadith in Ibn Majah, volume number four, 
hadith number 2804, the Prophet asks one of the sahabas that, what do you know about the martyrs amongst you? So he said that those who are killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are martyrs. Then the Prophet replied, if this was the only case, then martyrs in my ummah would be very few. Then he said, martyrs are those who are killed in the way of Allah. Martyrs are those who die in the cause of Allah. Martyrs are those who die because of stomach illness. Martyrs are those who die in a plague. And there's another addition by another narrator saying that martyrs are those who even, who even die while drowning. So these are five categories of people who the Prophet said are martyrs. Regarding the question, if a person dies in a plague, will he get, is he called a martyr or will he get a sawab of a martyr? There's another hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, hadith number five, seven, three, four, where the beloved Prophet Wasallam said, said, that the Prophet said, that Allah sends plagues to those who are afflicted by it. Allah sends plagues as a punishment to the unbelievers, to whomever he wants. And as for the believers, it is a blessing. And if a believer, during plague, lives patiently and believing that nothing will befall him except what Allah has ordained for him, Allah says he will get a reward of a martyr. In this hadith, a person who lives patiently is the criteria and believes that nothing will befall him, nothing will happen to him, except what is ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gets the sawab of a martyr. And according to Ibn Hajar, he says, Rahimullah, that there are three categories of people in this. A person who dies in plague, he gets the sawab of plague. A person who is affected by plague, but does not die, he too gets the sawab of a martyr. And a person who during plague is patient, and has faith that nothing will befall him, and he does not get sick, he does not die, yet he gets the sawab of a martyr. But a person who dies in plague, besides being called a martyr, he also gets a sawab of a martyr, he gets both ajar. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Is it allowed to kiss one's wife while fasting, and thus kissing have one, any effect on one's fast. Can a husband kiss his wife during fasting? The hadith in Sunnah Tirmidhi, volume number three, hadith number uh, 1297, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she said that the Prophet peace be upon him he kissed and embraced his wives during fasting many times. And he had more control over his desires than any one of you. That means kissing and embracing your wife during fasting is accepted, is permitted, as long as you can control your desire. There's another hadith, when a person comes and asks the Prophet, can I kiss my wife during fasting? The Prophet says yes. Another person comes and asks the Prophet, can I kiss my wife while fasting? He says, no. So the Sahabas asked me, the first person, you said yes. The second, you said no, why? So he said, I knew the first person could control his desires after kissing. The second person could not. Therefore, I said yes to the first person and no to the second person. That means you are allowed to kiss your wife and embrace your wife during fasting as long as you can control your desires and do not go ahead and do anything which will break the fast. You do not commit any act which are fast breakers. If you have control, you can, you can kiss your wife. Uh, there's another question asked by one of the person on the WhatsApp. It's Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, Dr. Zakir Uncle. My name is Sabiya Tabassum from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Question, how to become Allah's favorite Muslim? Huh? How can I become Dr. Zakir Naik? I'm a big fan of yours. Please pray for me so that I can become Dr. Zakir Naik and enter Janatul Firdaus. We Bangladeshi people love you and we respect you. 
There's a similar question asked, so I've asked my team to club the questions which are similar, so that more people are happy that I've asked the questions, that I've answered the question. A similar question is asked by Abdul Ghaffar, Ab Abdul Ghafoor Khan from Pakistan. Sir, I'm from Pakistan and I'm a great admirer of you. My profession is nursing and my question is how can I become like you? There's a third question similar to that. Assalamu alaikum, sir, I am Rahul Mia from India. I want to be a Dai, sir. Please tell me what should I do? I want to become like you and Sheikh Ahmad Dida. Regarding the basic question, all the three people have asked that, that all of them want to become a Dai like me. They want to enter Jal Firdaus. Let me tell you at the outset that it's not compulsory to become like me to enter Jal Firdaus. As far as I'm concerned, I, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept my efforts whatever he can. And I consider there are millions of people who are better than me in terms of knowledge, in terms of dawa. It is hadha bin fazhi rabbi. It is only because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only because of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever little bit I have achieved is because of him. The basic, I, and when I think of myself that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are more knowledgeable than me, how come people come for my talks? How come people listen to me on the Facebook, on the YouTube? I wonder. And then that reminds me, you know, that it is three criteria which I always say is important. Number one is that Allah says in the Quran, Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 160, that if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah. Number one is having faith and trust in Allah. Number two, Allah says in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up your pathways. Second is striving, struggling, hard work. Number three, Allah says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, First, alu hal zikri in kuntum la talamun. If you don't know, ask the person who's an expert. The third is the technique. So number one is Allah's help. Second is striving and struggling and hard work. Number three is technique. As far as getting Allah's help, the more you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you worship Him, the more you believe in Him, the more you have trust in Him, Inshallah, he will help you. Imagine, I couldn't have dreamt in my wildest dream of speaking in front of 25 people. I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world, the best doctor in the world, but in my wildest dream, I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Because, as many of you know, that I was a stammerer since childhood. When people used to ask me, what is my name? I said, my name is Zaza Zaza Zakir. So imagine what I cannot dream when I started doing dawa, when I went on the stage, I realized that I did not stammer. Most of the people, when they go in front of public, they get cold feet. For me, it was opposite. When I speak one-to-one, -one, I used to stammer, but in public, my stammering vanished. Then later on, when I used to speak one-to-one to, -one to non-Muslims, even that time I did not stammer. With Muslims, I used to stammer, and slowly, slowly, alhamdulillah, my stammering kept on reducing, and yet I stammer off the stage. Allah helps me, alhamdulillah. So, and I'm sure most of the millions of people who are watching today, most of you may have been multiple times better than what I was when I started my dawah. So when Allah can make such a person who's a stammerer give lectures where a large number is attending, so why can't you do that? I don't think so I've really done any great deed. Neither have I sacrificed something. People tell me, oh, I'm a fool that I left my medical profession. Some people come and say, oh, because you sacrificed your medical profession. There is no sacrifice. Giving up a medical profession, as compared to what Allah has given me in the field of dawah, everything, people watching, the fame, which, I, which was not the reason why we did it, the recognition, the heads of state meeting, me leaving the medical profession is not even the drop in the ocean, and Allah gave me the ocean. So the basic thing we realize is that we should sacrifice the things that you love for the sake of Allah. 
if you sacrifice for the sake of Allah, if you take one step in the way of Allah, Allah will take multiple times more close to you. So number one is sacrifice, love Allah, trust Allah, have faith in Him, and then ask an expert. As far as we have Dawa training programs, where we had in the past, where we train people, but number one is help of Allah, number two is striving and struggling, and last is the training. Training is a must, I did not get training, it was Allah who helped me, that's the least important. And to go to Jannah the those, follow the glorious Quran, and follow the Sahih Hadith, as much as the implement of the glorious Quran, as much as the implement of the Sahih Hadith and the commandments of the Prophet and Allah, there are more chances that you will enter Jannah, inshallah. There are many messages from Zubair Khan, from Muhammad Shafiq, from Imran Rashid, from Ashraf Hussain, from Ilyas, from Sultan Ponia, and my salam to all of you. It's difficult to answer all the questions, I already see thousands. Another question which is related, the respected Dr. Zakir Naik, Sir, I am Muzahar Hussain, city of Rampurhat. West Bengal, India. Do you have any trick for memorizing from different verses of the Quran or books of the same thing? A similar question asked by Brother Fahim from Kashmir, from Pakistan. Do you have a photographic memory? What is the reason behind your phenomenal memory? And again, the answer is the same what I gave earlier, that first is Allah's help, second is struggling and striving, and third is technique. There are various techniques for memory which you get when you do MBA courses, which is called as mapping and all the others. And believe me, all these techniques have good limitations. The best is the help of Allah. Certain things are there that when you memorize something, after about 20 minutes, again rehearse it, again rehearse it after two hours, again after a few hours. The more you rehearse it and revise it, the more chance it will be part of you. Then, next day, the more you use it, the more it becomes part of your memory. And once it goes into your permanent memory, then even if you don't revise, it will be in your memory. For example, Surah Fatiha. Almost all the Muslims, all the Muslims know Surah Fatiha. Even you get up from your sleep and they ask you to recite, you can recite. Because that has gone in the permanent memory. So the more you revise, the more you practice, it becomes part of your memory. I don't consider myself that I've got photogenic memory. So what I do is I strive, I have to keep on revising. I know that if this lecture has about 100, 150 quotations from Quran and Hadith, if I don't revise, maybe I may say 90%. If I revise, I may be able to say 99%. So before every lecture, I try and revise as much as possible so that it is closer to the accuracy. So more you strive, the more you struggle, the more you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah you'll be more. The next question is, I am Abdul Rahman from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. A prophet, peace be upon him, said, there is no adwa, contagious disease. Is this not contradicting with the medical science? Yes, there is a hadith of a beloved prophet, it is in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, hadith number 5707, where the beloved prophet said, there is no adwa. Adwa means contagious disease. What you have to understand that you have to read, and it says that there are no bad omens, etc., and it, and it continues the hadith. But if you read the shara and the commentary of this hadith, it says that here what the Prophet meant was when there is no adwa, there is no contagious disease which can be conveyed without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means that no one can acquire any contagious disease unless it is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not just a blanket statement that there is no contagious diseases. Otherwise, as you mentioned correctly, it would be against medical science. There are. And if you read the complete hadith, the hadith says there is no otherwise there is no contagious disease, meaning there is no contagious disease. It is not conveyed unless with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no bad omens, etc. And it says that if you see a leper, run away from it as though you have seen a lion. This indicates that leprosy is a contagious disease 
and the prophet is advising you when you see a person having contagious disease you run away indicating there is contagious disease so if you read the complete hadith you understand that the context is that you cannot get any contagious disease or any disease unless with the permission of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other hadith that i quoted that we have to take precaution during contagious diseases so that means of course there is contagious disease but have faith in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing will befall you unless except with the permission of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so according to the hadith there are contagious diseases according to the quran there are contagious diseases quran says that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent plagues on the bani israel and surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 59 so there are contagious diseases allah and allah says and the prophet said what precautions you should take but it's giving an indication that have faith in allah it will not harm you except with the permission of allah hope that answers the question this is a question by zubaid ahmed from hyderabad india how can one love allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam please be upon him more than himself to become a true muslim shall we do deeds out of love or fear of allah how can we love allah and his messenger more than we love ourselves and, and the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that a muslim is not a true muslim until he loves allah and his messenger more than himself so one of the criteria for you to be a complete good muslim is that you love allah and his rasul more than you love love yourself and uh, should you follow the deeds of the prophet and allah because you love them or because you fear them it should be both see the fear that you fear of allah is unlike the fear that you have of other things the love that you have for allah is unlike the love that you have for the love for allah is ultimate love and the fear of allah is that you don't want to displease allah you don't want to displease the beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's a different sort of fear it's a different sort of love altogether and how can you love allah more than yourself is when you realize that when you do this thing it is going to cause loss to you yet you do it for the sake of allah sake of allah that is the time you love allah more than yourself and you know very well that now you have got a very good offer for a job in a bank and got a very lucrative salary maybe the salary what you earn in the bank is offering you triple the salary but you know that the beloved prophet said that riba interest conventional interest bank is haram so you reject that why for the sake of allah now you are loving allah more than yourself if you do the job you will get triple the salary you will have all the luxury you will have more luxury of the world now this is an example of how you are loving allah more than yourself for example the prophet said that don't leave the place in which when you are living in a place and if it if a plague breaks out don't leave it so you have to obey allah and his messenger you you cannot run away you have to have faith be patient whatever will befall you even if i have to die I'll die if you die I become a martyr so here you are following the commandment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is not only proven by medical science but you are doing for sake of allah you are loving allah more than yourself so always when you put your you, you put allah and his messenger more than yourself that means you are loving allah more than yourself and if you love allah more than yourself then you are a true believer a true moment and in there is a question from abdul fahim assalamu alaikum zakir bhai i am jawad from usa a student i wanted to, maybe abdul fahim maybe the other name is coming out of this this is a question from the youtube so his real name is jawad this is assalamu alaikum zakir sahib i am jawad from usa a student i wanted to know if online tarawi are allowed or not as long as online tarawi whether your you know the tarawi is going on in makkah haram and you are in bangladesh or usa or malaysia or india can you read tarawi following the online tarawi and it is unanimous decision unanimous fatwa from all the fuqahas that for a salah for you to be part of the jama you should be close to the jama they differ the opinion in different fuqaha uh-huh. the maliki school of thought say that even if there is a road or even if there is a river in between you yet yet you are part of the jama according to hanafi school of thought it is about two rows if it more than distance more than two rows 
then you can't be part of Jamaat according to Hamli, as long as you hear, as long as you see the Naveri, but all of them agree that you should be closed, you cannot be far away. So unanimously all the Fuqahs agree that you cannot do Tarawi online from another city, another time zone, even same zone if you're very far away, the distance is miles together, you cannot do. But the question asked, the question someone asked, that in this situation where there is lockdown and almost all the mosques are closed, now can we read Tarawi online or by listening on the television, whether it be from the Haram or whether any other place? Okay. As far as this is concerned, most of the FIC council that I have tried to find the answer in the last few days, I did not find any FIC council saying that, you know, you can read online. But there is a fatwa by Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu, and according to me, I mean, he is one of the best living Islamic scholars today, alhamdulillah. Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu, he's from Mauritania, and he's one of a great scholar, he's a muhaddis, mashallah, one of the most knowledgeable one of the most knowledgeable living Islamic scholars in the world. And, and I respect him, and I've met him several times, and I'm very close to him, alhamdulillah. According to him, his fatwa is the same, generally you cannot do online, but in this situation, because most of the mosques are closed, and most of the people don't have who are huffas in the house, he has given the fatwa only on this situation, not otherwise, because the mosques are closed. You can follow the Imam online, whether on the television, and your Salah will be accepted. The other Fuqahas, the other scholars are saying, and the other Fiqh councils are saying, because Tarawi is not a Fard, we don't want to open the door yet. We are not a Fard, it is a Sunnah the Mawqidah, very important Sunnah, so let's not open the door. But according to Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu, that you can do, if it's going to get you more khushu and more concentration in your salah. This is the next question. By Ibrahim from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir. If a person acquires wealth by cheating and later realizes his mistake and decides to stop cheating, and decides to stop cheating, what will he do with the acquired wealth? But natural, if a person wants to repent, if he is doing any evil, there are criteria for, for repentance, and there are basically four criteria for repentance, or are the five. Number one is agree it is wrong. So if he's cheating, agree cheating is wrong. Number two, stop it immediately. Number three, don't do it again. Number four, ask for forgiveness and repent. And number five, undo it if you can. So for repentance to be accepted, besides agreeing it is wrong, besides stopping it immediately, besides asking for forgiveness, besides not doing it again, the last criteria is undo if you can. So if you have acquired wealth by cheating, if you have cheated an individual person in business, see to it, you give that wealth back to him. If you have cheated generally and you don't know who the person is, then see to it, you give that money in charity to the poor people. If acquired wealth is by cheating, or if you have robbed, see to it, the person you have robbed from, give that object back or give that wealth back, that will get you the best ajar and Allah will accept your repentance, inshallah. Uh, there are many questions. I'm just trying to select the better questions. And the next question is from Danny Novari. He's from Cairo, Egypt. I want to ask you about stock market. What does the Sharia say about trading in stocks? As we know, if we invest in long term, it's halal. How about trading for a short time, for one hour, for a day, for a week? I make sure that it's not gambling because I do analysis before buying and sell it after getting capital gain. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. As far as can you invest in halal stock and can you do it for a short term, for a day, or for a week, or for a few hours? As far as if you want to invest in stock, first you have to identify whether the stock that you're investing is halal. 
there are various criteria of how to analyze whether the stock that you're purchasing, the shares of your purchasing of a company is halal or not. Number one, the major, the, the activity of the company should not be haram. It should not be dealing in alcohol. It should not be dealing in pork. So the number one is it should, it should not be a bank, which is based on riba, the conventional bank. The activity, basic activity should not be haram. Number two, there are various other criteria that the company should not take so much loan that the debt to the cash ratio is very high. So there are fukahas and scholars who have devised that the activity should not be haram and even the debt taken should be a minute percentage. There are various criteria. So you have got indexes. For example, you have the Dow Jones Index of Islamic Stocks. So these people are experts and they lay the criteria why these stocks are halal, why these stocks are not halal, it's haram. So if it is identified as a halal stock by an expert uh, fuqaha in this field or an Islamic organization which is specialized, you can invest in that in stock, it's permissible. The second part of the question, can you invest for a short time, for a few hours, for a day, for a week, and I'm expert, I'm not, I'm not gambling because I am, I am doing, I am doing a calculation. See, when you buy shares, is actually you are becoming a shareholder. I am asking a simple question with all the calculation. Will you physically be a partner, not shares, physically be a partner of a business only for one hour? And the answer is no. Will you, with all your calculation, will you say, okay, I want to be a partner for one hour? No, you cannot. <laughs> physically, if you say that I want to share and become a partner for a day, would you become of a company? No, you cannot. So stock exchange gives us easy flexibility to buy shares, but that does not mean you should gamble. If it's done for a short period, intentionally that I will sell it when it goes off, give, and you keep it for a few hours or, a, for, or a, for a day or a few days, it tend to point to gambling. If it's done unintentionally that you want to keep it for a few years, and then you realize something market has crashed and then you want to sell it, that's acceptable. But from first you plan that you're going to sell it as soon as it increases, even if it's a few hours or not, this is speculation and this is not permitted in Islam. So you can involve in stock if it's a halal stock, halal share, but don't speculate, don't do it for few hours, keep it for a long term. Uh, the next question from, from Mary from USA, she's a revert. And she mentioned that, Salam, I took Shahada in April 2019, that's about one year back, and still confused about praying. I have two autoimmune diseases which make my leg dead and crippled, so I can't do prayer properly. I also have to take medicines during daytime due to spasms in my face. So I try to only take one medicine that stops the spasms with little water in midday and keep the rest for when the sun goes down. Other Muslims tell me I can't fast because I'm sick. Others say I broke the fast in between by taking that pill. By the way, I see I'm refraining from all types of food except a tiny bit of water for one pill. And when it comes to prayers, I have no idea to pray other than how Christians pray. And I have been ridiculed by many Muslims telling me I will never be a Muslim because I can't do these things. It makes me feel as if I'm letting down my Allah. And it makes me depressed because I don't know what else to do. I feel Allah will never accept me because of this. I never taught how to do prayers. I was never taught how to do prayers. I tried to learn it from the YouTube, which is sad because the people who did shahada with me just left me on my own. When I do ablution, it is mandatory that I wash my feet. I have tape on my right foot because it's dead with no feeling. The tape keeps it in the right direction. When I walk, it will drag. I have to wear compression socks or blood will rush to my feet. But everything else I can do with no problem. I would like to say assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam to Sister Mary. And I'd like, you, I'd like to welcome you to the fold of Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all your sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get you closer to Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you Jannah of Firdaus. There are basically three questions that you asked. One is, 
regarding offering salah, the second is regarding wudu, and the third is regarding fasting. As far as the first question is concerned that you don't know how to do proper salah, inshallah I will ask one of my colleagues to send you a book on salah. It is, the, it is called The Prophet's Prayer by Sheikh Nasiruddin Albani. It, is, it describes the prayer in detail. And the point to be noted, sister, that because you're sick, it is not required that you pray exactly how you should pray if there are difficulties. You mentioned in your question there are so many difficulties. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 102, that those who are sick or those who are traveling, you know, they can shorten the, I mean, they shorten the prayer. And those who cannot, those who are sick and those who cannot pray while standing, they can pray while sitting. If you cannot pray while sitting, you can pray while lying. If you cannot pray while lying, only with indication. So, sister, salah is never excused for any man, for a woman, unless she's having a menstrual cycle or postpartum, these few things, it is compulsory for a man if he's an adult Muslim. And if he's conscious, salah is not excused at all unless he's unconscious. If you can't pray standing, you should pray while sitting. If you can't pray sitting, you should pray while lying. If you cannot pray lying, at least by indication. So sister, whatever difficulty you have, you may be aware of certain things, but you cannot do them. It is excused. Imagine, you can sit while praying. And there was a time when I myself had problems in the knee, and I showed to the best of doctors, and for two years, I used to sit on the chair and pray. So if you have a medical problem, if you cannot follow the exact requirement as described by the Prophet, it is perfectly all right, you will get the same thing, even if you pray while sitting, if you, even if you pray while lying, even if you pray by indication, if you are paralyzed, and only your eyes are moving, you can pray with your eyes. There are some people who only fingers are used, they can pray with the finger. So praying is not excused at all until certain, except in certain conditions of women, in menstruation, postpartum, etc. But for the men, as long as they are conscious and they are adult, they have to pray. Inshallah, I will send a book to you which will describe in detail. And inshallah, even if you cannot do, do those things because of a medical problem, don't worry about it. Don't do it. You can sit and pray. You can lie and pray. Come to the second part of the question, that you have got plaster on your feet and you have got some, um, which you cannot, do wudu cannot take it out. In this case, is where if you are wearing a plaster because your feet is fractured or if a medical problem and you cannot take them out, you can do masa over it. You can just rub your wet hands while doing wudu. Other parts you do wudu as you normally do. On your leg which has a plaster, that part which has a plaster, just rub with your hand, the wet hand, and that will suffice. You don't have to remove the plaster. Your wudu would be complete, inshallah. And the last part of the question, that you have to take some medicines, you have to take medical, and if not twice, at least once a day, so can you fast? And if you take little water and little medicine, will your fast be accepted? Sister, in certain situations where you cannot fast because of your illness, if the doctor says, OK, you can take the medicine early in the morning before you start the fast, and just immediately after you break the fast, and you can survive, mashallah, you can keep the fast. But the doctor says, no, you have to take it during daytime, maybe at midday. There's no other option. Otherwise, it's detrimental to your health. Then you are excused from fasting. If you have a disease which is temporary, then you're excused for that time. And the moment you get well, you can compensate for the fast which you missed. But if you have a disease which is permanent and it will never be solved, then what you have to do, if so, and you cannot fast later on, then what you do, you feed a person, a poor person, for every fast you miss. So if you miss the full month, the 29 days, 30 days, that many poor people you feed so that you get the ajar. And believe me, sister, you'll get the full ajar of fasting. You don't have to go into trouble. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to put difficulties into you. So if you cannot fast, because of medical problem, Allah has given you a concession. Just feed a poor man for every fast you missed, and inshallah, you'll get the ajar of fasting. Inshallah, your WhatsApp number has come onto the mobile. I will ask my wife, inshallah, to inshallah call you later on, and so that she can help you and help you in other aspects of Islam. And whenever you're free, you're most welcome to call my wife. 
She'll be texting you soon. Soon, she'll speak to you, inshallah. If not today, tomorrow, inshallah. And see to it that on one-to-one -one basis, if you have any queries on Islam, she will answer them. And mashallah, my wife is also, mashallah, very good in giving lectures because she doesn't give generally in public. Therefore, less people have heard her. But mashallah, inshallah, she'll help you to fulfill and follow as much of Islam as possible, sister. Jazakallah shukran. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he put you in Jannah Firdos, that even in this condition you accepted Islam and you close, inshallah, this will inshallah benefit you in this world as well as in the akhirah. We have a few more minutes and as time permits, inshallah, we will try and take a couple of more questions. There is a question asked, uh, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Zahid, I am from Chittagong, Bangladesh. Will Peace TV Network launch an online dawah course where Muslims will be trained to give dawah to non-Muslims? A similar question is, passed, is, is asked by one or two other people. A second similar question to the earlier one is, Assalamu alaikum doctor, your website has very interesting your website is very interesting, is very interesting. In that website you said about international dawah training program. Is it after Ramadan? Is it available online? The third question, if, which is similar. My name is Isa Kazi. I'm from Mumbai, India. So mashallah, similar question is being asked from someone from Mumbai, India, from some Chittagong, Bangladesh, and other parts of the world. I wanted to know about the dawah training program, how can I attend it? All they asking about dawah training program, as far as I'm concerned personally, I've taken very few dawah training programs. I've taken a couple of dawah training programs for the local people, that the Indians, and I've taken two international dawah training programs in my full life, that's a complete course. One was in 1999, which was uh, for approximately, approximately 40 days, the working days uh, were about 20, 324. And the second one we had after several years, that is in 2016, again in Bombay. In both these our training programs, we selected 20 people, 20 people from different parts of the world. We received hundreds and more than 1,000 applications. We selected and we had a training program in 2016, January and February for about 50 days. The working days were about 33. And we have recorded this, this our training program. Personally, for me to conduct dawah training program is too time consuming. That is the reason the last dawah training program we recorded it. And inshallah, if time permits, we'll edit it and have it on the satellite channel and other media also. As the question asked, that we have just launched our website. The address is zakirnaik.com. I repeat, our earlier website was, it was closed down because they're associated with an organization and the allegation laid by the government. At that time, the Islamic Research Foundation was the fourth largest visited Islamic website in the world. We just launched on the first of Ramadan a new website by the name zakirnaik.com. And one section in this website is International Dawah Training Program. And when you click, it says, coming soon, inshallah. Because Dawah Training Program itself is another website, individual, different by itself. We have yet certain portions to be completed in the main website. That the reason some part says will be coming soon. After we complete the other parts of the website, we will inshallah build our international Dawah Training Program. This international Dawah Training Program on the website zakirnaik.com is an online program, has most of the notes. It will not be as effective as attending it directly. If you attend live, it's a different ball game altogether, a different impact altogether. If you hear it or watch it on a video, it may have about maybe 20% impact. If you do it online, it may have 10% impact, but something is better than nothing. All the notes, inshallah, will be uploaded on this website, dawa, how it's to be done to atheists, to the Christians, to the Hindus, to the Parsis, the impact of dawa, various aspects of public speaking, and various, it's there. We expect that this would take another one or two months. Inshallah, in the month of Ramadan, we will complete the other portions which are pending because this website is voluminous. It is huge. 
it has a lot of information and almost all my lectures will be uploaded on inshallah now few are there there are lecture scripts there are books of mine my interactions my meetings and all the other facilities are there it is going to be voluminous and same time it will also have uh, another exclusive section called as international dawah training program time is short and uh, we are running out of time inshallah we'll just take one more question